Hi, I'm Brittany Frampovich, and I'm here from No Trouble, and I'm interviewing my good friend Lisa Carve from the band Incendio, and she's also part of a duo with her husband, Carve and Duran. So, Lisa, thanks for being here. You're welcome, Brittany. Thanks for having me. This is exciting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Pandemic-style uh, interview. Yeah. So. <laughs> we've all got to do over the past year. Yeah, well, um, it's new for me, but thanks for thanks for uh, thanks for doing this. So I'll, I'm going to be learning the ropes with you. <laughs> so um, we've got a written interview from from you already, and this is kind of be like a uh, addition to that to uh, just kind of flush things out, add more to the dialogue. Um, okay. Reading your bio about your father, he was living as a cartoonist, and you, you kind of have a musical background you studied classical guitar and then you and you came to bass so tell tell me a little more about that do you mind no no not at all um yeah I grew up playing Spanish guitar I started playing when I was about nine when I moved out to uh to California and I immediately started taking lessons with this man named Burdell Mathis um and so I was studying Spanish guitar flamenco he also stopped ta um, taught a little jazz um so I just grew up playing guitar, learning to read, and also singing and playing Joni Mitchell and folk songs and all kinds of things. Um, and loved the guitar. I mean, that is one of my first loves. But somewhere in college, a couple of girlfriends were, they were keyboard players. They were just going to go jam. And they said, you know, we need a bass player. It's the same strings as your guitar. Here's a bass. Just come up and jam with us. So, you know, I was like, sure, okay, that sounds like fun. And um, I just fell in love with it. It was, uh, I, I guess, because it, I, I hadn't studied it, so it was less structured. And I was just jamming, and I was playing rock, and I hadn't really ever played rock. Um, I, I, I had listened to a lot of rock. I loved Led Zeppelin, you know, of course, and The Who, and, but I hadn't jammed in rock bands. So with the bass, I just started playing in rock bands. And um, almost right away, I started playing clubs on the Strip, the Whiskey and the Troubadour and Gazaris. And I was just having fun doing it. So I, I just continued playing bass as I went through college, got my degree in classical guitar. And then upon graduating, my first gig, my first road gig was with the hair metal band Vixen. So, you know, I went from, yeah. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh I went from playing classical guitar um, and still doing that at, just to, to touring and, and was having just a great time doing it and just loved the instrument. So nice. that began my bass journey. Nice. I have a question. Um, a little off the beaten path, but it just occurred to me as we we're talking. Um, something you and I both have in common is we were, we were classically trained at one point. Um, I did have the garage band experience a little bit on guitar before college. Um, we both transitioned to being working electric players at some point. So how was it for you navigating working with a drummer? Do you mind me asking? Cause that's a transition. It, it was, you know, yeah. it, um, I, that's an interesting question. I'm trying to think back on that. Yeah, I just it, it just occurred to me while we we're talking. Yeah, it was very different because playing classical, you you can take a lot of liberties, and playing in duos, singing, accompanying yourself. I did take a lot of liberties. You know, you slow down, speed up, whatever. Um, I, it seemed like I just fell into it. I was playing with a really great drummer, and. Uh, I don't know. It just, I, I just enjoyed it. I, okay. I really remember it being an issue. Um, I just remember going back and just really starting to practice a lot with, uh, with, with recordings. Yeah. Um, uh, just playing along with, with, uh, you know, with Zeppelin or whoever. And um, God, I was playing or practicing with Stanley Clark. I really got into Stanley school days and things like that. And uh just different people. So then I was just practicing along with them. And, and, uh, I don't know, I guess it, it wasn't a traumatic experience, I guess, or I would remember that, <laughs> but it, 
I fell into it naturally and really enjoyed it. Nice. And it was also just the, um, the freedom of not doing a recital, you know, mm-hmm. and rocking out and not going in and taking a bow and just that nervousness. Yeah. Um, there was the excitement of playing in a rock band and it was, it was different and I enjoyed yeah. that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, question. I, I'll have to think back, see if I wake up screaming in the middle of the night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's okay. Cause there's a, it's a definitely transition. Uh, in my case, it was double bass. So you're, you're like a soloist with a, with a piano or maybe you're an orchestral bassist, but then you go, um, you know, you've got this, this machine you're working with and you know you're connecting the harm uh, the harmonic element of the band the guitars and all that with that with that rhythm section so it it, it is very freeing and very powerful too so yeah did, yeah. did you, was it a hard transition for you um I don't recall i don't think it was either um i just kind of was curious because i know there's like all these it, it seems to me there's a lot of questions sometimes about you know oh you know, working with a drummer and how do you, you lock with your drummer and all that good stuff. And there are, there are like, you know, things to do, but, you know, I was kind of curious because it didn't seem like it was entirely difficult either. Yeah. <laughs> and, and there's not many people I know who came from a similar background like that. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. Yeah. Lots of practicing with recordings like you and, and with a drum machine, you know, so. Yeah. But in, and mostly that's just refining one's timekeeping, in my humble opinion. So, yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. And thinking like that, like I can't slow down, I can't speed up here, you know. But yeah. I think with a great drummer too, they kind of drive you along, you know, because they're not yeah. moving. So yeah, it, it's like, oh, okay. And yeah. that's certainly working with a great drummer from the from the start. Yep. Okay. That works. I was just curious. That just you know. <laughs> yeah, no that that is oops, that is a good question. So um, on your bio, so a, a cool little side note. And again, this may be just my my little quirks. I, I make my own jewelry and stuff. Um, you talked about learning to weld and oh. and inventing an instrument. Oh, you know. That was so interesting. My first year in college, I moved up to College of the Redwoods by Eureka. Yeah. So I had the most interesting theory teacher in, in college, um, my first year of college. Um, he was a man named Steve Rupenthal, and he had studied with a man named Alan Strange that had studied with a man named Harry Parch. I don't know if you know who Harry Parch is. He um, was an American composer music theorist and made hundreds of his own instruments, um, which are or were on display at San Jose State. He was very much into 20th century music and um, working in in 46 tone scale. So so, um, just intonation. So he worked, um, so, our, our modern Western scale is tempered. It's not what happens in nature. When you hit a note and you have an overtone, you get an octave, a fifth, a fourth, a third. But what we have as a fifth is tempered. It's changed. It's not what happens naturally. Just like a rainbow has a certain color scale that happens naturally. If you went in and went, oh, I'm going to change that a little. I'm going to move that red. I'm going to change that orange, yellow to, you know, make it work better that's what western music has done to our scale and we did that because when when we started having fixed instruments like the piano like guitars um we had to modulate and when you modulated with just intonation it didn't sound correct it sounded out of tune so when you see box well-tempered clavier that's where it started where we came up with equal distance between 12 notes which is our western Yep. So getting back to that. So uh, Stephen was very much into just intonation and and um, Harry Parch and and 20th century music and, and all these interesting things. So he would have all of us um, for for our projects 
compose something in a different way than you would think normally. So he, he had all these challenging things that you wouldn't generally get in first year theory because he was a grad student too that had just graduated. So he was excited to share these things. So okay. he was working as a welder with this man named Stan Bennett up in Eureka making um, kinetic sculptures. I was his apprentice. So he said, for, one, for your um, end project, why don't you invent an instrument? I'd like you to do that. And I was like, oh, oh okay. You know, I can. <laughs> Whoa. Can you so, see that? Yeah, it's like a, like a, a, a cone attached to a sounding board, perhaps, of some kind? Yes. So what this is. That? So I came up, I made a three, a three foot cone. Okay. And it's 12 strings across the front. And I made like a piano tuning board. And then six sets of four strings that run throughout the cone. Wow. And tuning boards down at the bottom, tuning pegs like piano tuning mechanism. Okay. So the theory behind that, because I wanted to incorporate just intonation and, and uh, overtone series, was that you would play that, and there's no nodes particularly, so you would tune the inner strings to the overtone series of whatever you were tuning it to. So it's a modal instrument. So if I was gonna tune it to an open A, then maybe I'd tune things to A and E, and whatever the sympathetic vibrations, the overtone series for that particular key. So when you play it, it would set the others into vibration, and you'd just get this really rich sound. So that's, that's what I did. Have you performed with this instrument? I, I have a couple of times in some um, uh, <laughs> very esoteric settings because that's kind of what it lends itself to. Uh, one of the, well, actually the first time I went into a studio it was with this guy called Jason Marks. He had something called the Neoteric Orchestra. He used to work with Frank Zappa and he was into modern music as well. Um, so I did a solo performance uh, or a duo performance with the Zill and I think Paul Whitehead, he did Bode Symbol. He was the one that did all the album covers for the early Genesis. Oh, wow. Okay. Whitehead also played Bo Symbol. So on the, the early recording of, of the Pillory, the Neoteric Orchestra, there's me playing Zill with Paul playing the Bode Symbol. So it was very out avant-garde stuff. And I've done a few things like that with it, with a couple of other people that, that like that. And then years later, Jason asked me if I could record more Zill because he wanted to put out <laughs> another uh, edition of the ne Neoteric Orchestra. So I recorded a bunch of stuff and sent it to him. Do you still have the Zill? Yes, I've got two of them, much to people's dismay because they're huge. <laughs> Um, the first one I did, because I do oxycetylene welding, so when you heat in metal, it, it warps. So the first one I made myself, and it warped a little bit, but I, I put it together and I, and I made it. Um, and But the pressure of the strings was pulling the strings out of tune. It was pulling on the cone too much. So I made a second one, and I had people meg weld it, which is more running a bead, and then I put reinforcements and attach the strings to the reinforcement so it stayed in tune better. Um, so yeah, I've got two of them sitting around. It's, 
it's a lot to retune them and to restring them because it's piano string. So it's metal. So they rust when you touch them. Um, so every time I'm going to record with it, it's a whole thing to take the strings down and yeah, so, but I, I do have two of them. And once in a while, I've used them on a couple of incendio recordings just as a, a drone in the background. I think it's on, a, mm, I can't remember a couple of a couple of songs that we did. Okay, okay. Yeah. Well, if, if you recall that, I'll see if I can edit that in, in the, even in just in text, so. Yeah, sure, yeah, that, yeah that's exciting, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's fun. Right. It's Hans Zimmer, give this girl a call. <laughs> I said, Hans Zimmer, give this girl a call. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's so, it really sounds amazing. It does. It's, it's so flexible and you can bow it and you can go in and play it and then bend the note from down below. And it just creates this because it's metallic. Like a, so, wall, like a talking drum kind of thing. Yeah. But with a string. So you're just, you're creating this bending string sound that's, um, that's so resonant because of the metal uh enclosure instead of wood yeah i have to record some and send it to you okay this is so cool all right <laughs> it's really fun thank, thank you for sharing that that is um ah this is great <laughs> okay um let's see i'm gonna i'm gonna shift topics um we're talking about uh you being a classical guitarist who switched to bass and uh, historically, like we're looking right now at, uh, you know, a lot more female bass players, it seems. We're still yeah. the minority, but but it seems like the ranks are growing. Yes. Um, and I was in middle school and high school reading about a lot of the things that you got to experience in the 80s. Uh, in Vixen, we've joked about how I was reading about you <laughs> as a kid. Um yeah, so touring with Lindsey Buckingham, all this, all this stuff, and it's amazing you've toured on guitar and and bass. Yeah. So very few people get to say that, but you're you 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 thrived in a time when female bassists were uh, far rarer, uh, more unicornish, a gem, in yeah, than they are now. So, what was that like? What was that like? establishing a career in that time when it was even more of a rarity you know it, it was exciting because i guess i was a rarity there wasn't too many of us um you know i i just threw myself in i i just if there was an audition i just went for it i i didn't give a lot of thought about being a female um about anything. Uh, I, I remember I, I try, you know, I, I guess I was just kind of brazen. I just went in and just, just went for things. Um, I remember when I auditioned for Leon Patillo, um, it was supposed to be a, a tour around the world, a world tour. And I'd gone in and I'd auditioned with my friend, Amy Knowles on drums that I used to play a lot with. She's amazing. And we went auditioned and I didn't hear back, but you know, in those days we we'd go in for so many auditions. Sometimes you'd hear back, sometimes you wouldn't, whatever it was. And I hadn't heard back and I was over at a friend's house and uh, Dave Vendette, who was Leon's manager at the time. And Dave Vendette was Ike and Tina Turner's manager back in the day. And now he was Lynn's, um, Leon's manager. And so he called and it, it was back still when we had uh, answering machines. So you're always calling <laughs> answering machine to find out and this guy had called and I I honestly had forgotten that I had auditioned for Leon because I hadn't heard back from him oh, and wow. and Dave called and I, I called back and I was like um I'm sorry I I don't know who who is this who's calling and he goes you auditioned for for Leon this is like a really this is going to be we'd like you to have the gig. This is like a really big deal. I mean, this is a world tour. And I was like, oh, right. <laughs> so, um, but, you know, you, you try to just go on to the next thing and not fixate on the last thing in case you don't get it. Because you know how that is. If you fixate and you're like worried all the time, then you're, it, it kind of holds you back. Um, 
and, and that was a female band. So Leon was taking advantage of, of that time period and having that female band that was a novelty behind him. Um, because Prince was hiring females. He had Elisa and Wendy and, and Leon wanted to do the same thing. So he put together a female band and um, they were really all great players. And he did such a great thing. I mean, he featured us all. I sang a duet with him. We all took solos. Um, so, you know, there was a lot of good, you know, of course you had to deal with people asking you ridiculous questions like we all do, you know, like, wow, what made you play the bass or, you know, and, and really as a classical guitarist, there weren't a lot of female classical guitarists either, but, um, uh, in the classical world, they just don't, they just didn't ask you such ridiculous questions all the time. You know, you just weren't dealing with it as much. Um, so I, I guess I just really try to ig ignore the dumb questions and, and just move on. You know, um, you know how it is. I mean, sometimes you, you get annoyed with it. Um, or people treat you in a, in a dumb way or whatever, but um, there was just so much going on back then. There was just a lot of work, a lot of club work, a lot of auditions. Um, I would say the local 47, there was a lot more um, work that they were just offering people other than just studio work. You know, there was a lot of sidelining. You know, I did a lot of things for, for fame where you're just the person in the background playing along like you're the background band or whatever but there was a lot of that happening then so it, it was it was a fun time um yeah i i i i think that uh, i i'm sure maybe i was a little bit more frustrated back then with certain things and you know actually there were there was um a, a story i'll tell you um a, a rather well-known drummer had a band and I was playing with, a, which I, who I won't mention his name. Uh, <laughs> okay. And, um, I was playing with another female band and he heard about me through someone and he and his band were, came in and were courting me to be the bass player. Um, and he brought his whole band in to see me and he was calling me and talking to me. You're going to be perfect. It was a real rocking band. I mean, I was perfect for it because that was my whole vibe. And um, he'd sent me the album, if you can, you know, to, to learn all the music and, you know, talked about what I was going to do and I was going to audition or play for his manager and blah, blah, blah. And, and then he called out of the blue and said, uh, the audition's off. I'll get back to you. It was very weird. Just his whole tone. It was like, okay, you know, and then uh, I maybe called him once. He's like, I, I, yeah, I'm still, I'm, uh, there's, well, I'll get back to you. And, and then I never heard back from him. And I thought, well, that was very odd. And then I ran into his band at the union and they were saying, oh man, I'm so sorry. We're so sorry you went through that. But when this guy told his manager that he wanted a female bass player, his manager's like, you can't have a female bass player in your hard rock band. You can't do that. And he's like, oh, why can't, you know, and he didn't <laughs> argue for it. He just like, just blew me off. And had he done that, he was kind of good at the cutting edge because right then was when a lot of people were starting to hire female bass players. But um, so that was like a, a real obvious, unfortunate story of being a female and being blown off because of being a female. So ups and downs, but yeah, ups clearly, and downs. clearly more ups. <laughs> yeah, oh, really a lot more ups. But that was yeah. <laughs> I run into him like, hey, how are you? <laughs> <laughs> wow, wow. Okay. So musicians during pandemic, we're all growing our skill sets. Um, uh, you know, video editing. Uh, using a home studio. I mean, there's a whole lot of, a whole lot of stuff. So um, what are you more curious to learn about this year? You personally? Well, I'm always trying to improve my production skills because my, our, my focus and our focus 
has really been to get more recorded music out there, whether it's library music, which we're trying to focus to get more in the, the stream because that's more back end income um, or recording more of our own original music. So I'm just always trying to get um, new pre's, new updating stylus, updating um, virtual instruments, just working on, on techniques. Um, so I've been focusing on that um, with the, the, the projects that, that we've had. I've, I'm writing music for a ballet and it's all um, um, medieval music. So it's, I'm, I'm really kind of been digging into that and, and back into orchestration, that type of orchestration, because they want it um, oh, maybe a tiny modern spin, but really they're looking for that, that sound. So I've just been trying to get, you know, the better oboe sound, all of these things um, so that I can phrase better with virtual instruments, even if I wind up hiring a, a real instrumentalist, which I'm doing. But still, in case, um, yeah, so just digging into orchestration, um, programming, things like that. So that's been a lot of this, um, although I have really been just itching to, to and I have started to, to do that, to just really start practicing my bass more, because that's sort of slipped, I'll say. And I've just been wanting to, I guess, after after talking to Mohini Day, I was like, I really <laughs> I want to start practicing. Yeah an inspiration. Um, so those things, and then I, I, by virtue of the book that we wrote and producing other artists, I've just started helping people get their um, um, their online presence happening, either get their their um, publishing company established, um, things like that. So. Uh, those are those are the things that I've been focusing on. All right, so that's actually going to draw me to my next question. And I'm I'm full disclosure for the audience. I'm also in that target audience of people that they've been trying to help. Thank you for that, guys. Um, <laughs> but uh, one of the things you did do, uh, I, I guess, projects that got wrapped up early on in pandemic that was happening before pandemic. It just kind of came to closure at the, at the start of it. Was the book Thrive and Survive. Um, so, you know, we, we can, you just touched on it briefly. I was curious, uh, your target audience, what do you, what can folks get from the book? Uh, tell us about the book. Tell us how it will help them. Okay. Well, that's interesting because that was the focus of the beginning part of the pandemic, because I had started writing that and had been writing it for the past maybe year and a half, but because we kept touring and taking off, I couldn't focus on it. So then the minute things shut down, besides streaming and going, oh, we got to learn to stream like immediately. Um, I was like, I've got to focus on getting the book done. And, and having all of that time to do that was really um, needed because writing a book and editing, you, I really had no idea. I mean, I knew it was going to be a lot of work, but you just edit and edit and edit. So um, we were able to finish it and get it, get it out um, somewhere in the middle of the pandemic which a lot of people were like, oh, you're releasing a book called Thrive and Survive in the Music Business in the middle of the pandemic when no one can work. Brilliant. Slightly ironic, but but yeah. <laughs> you know, and I did think of that and I thought, you know, there's still a lot that people can get out of this. And it, this is not going to be this way forever. And if people read it and learn what they can, then when things open up, they'll be that much more informed in a lot of different areas. So because we're both touring musicians and, and playing our own music, as well as recording musicians and writing a lot of um, music library, production library music, and, and occasionally scoring for picture and things like that, we know both of those worlds. And um, over the years, we've just tutored a lot of people. People would come and say, hey, how do you book your own band? What are you doing? Um, how do you, what can you tell us about booking conferences, things like that? Or um, can you tell us about royalties and how do we get that? And I, the, the thing that finally made me just go, I really need to write this book is a somebody that was very well established 
um, in one area, asked a question about his royalties and, and just asked the completely wrong question. And I just thought, you know, people need to know this. And I know it's out there. Uh, people have written about it and there's certain things you can hear about on CD Baby. But I really wanted to write a book from a musician's perspective that was out there doing it all the time. I wanted to write how you, how we as original artists book our band and, and everything that goes into that from the beginning to the end, like how you contact um, people that potentially will book you, where you find those people, what that package looks like, how you even speak to them, um, uh, where you find them, um, like, like festivalnet.com, uh, Polestar, things like that. Uh, and then the process that we go through of how to book uh, or how to set up a tour. You know, there's, there's all these, these things that you have to know um, before you just launch yourself. I mean, you can, but you, our idea was that, and, and what we want to do always is that we want to come back with money and as little stress as possible. And, and there's going to be stress, but the more organized you can be, as far as booking your hotel, booking your your plane, um, advancing the venue, speaking to the sound man, uh, knowing the closest place to stay for convenience, understanding where you're traveling, um, renting gear, all of these things. I put it from beginning to end, that whole process, so that people could read and understand how to do that. And, and it would be right there so that it wasn't just me talking about it, but they could constantly go back and refer to it. Like, okay, what was the, what were they talking about here? So that was the first part of the book. The second part, because we are dealing with getting our royalties all the time because we have placements. And for people that don't know what music library is, that's production music. So a music library will hire us to say, we want um, a heavy metal CD, we want a funk CD and we will write in a certain style. And they do that because they don't have the money to, some people do, but a lot of productions don't have the money to license Crazy Train from Ozzy. But they want something that feels like that without having to spend the money. So they go to libraries and they say, you know, what do you have as far as heavy metal? What do you have as far as classical? So that's what music libraries are. So they'll hire composers like us and we will write a, a track or we'll write a whole CD of that. So we get our royalties, our back end from these placements. So we have to understand what writer's royalties are, publishing royalties, streaming royalties, owning your masters, all these different things generate different royalties. And you need to, as a, as a recording artist or as a composer, you need to understand where these royalties come from. And so many people don't. So when people would come to us and say, I just, you know, wrote a piece and now it's, I got it placed in a movie or a TV show or whatever. And now I'm waiting for my royalties and great. Who's your, what's your PRO? Performing Rights Organization, ASCAP, BMI, CSAC. They're like, uh, oh, what's that? Like, oh, well, you better know and why don't you come on over? Because you have to join one. Because if you don't, you won't be getting any royalties for that. Um, so people would come over and we'd explain these things. Um, but as anything, when you explain things quickly, even, even if it's been a couple of hours, and you dump like years worth of, of information and as I used to say, we're just vomiting out this information on people. And you'd see people, and especially JP, because JP can just like go off and just like talk, blah, 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 blah. And I'd see people glaze over. It's like <laughs> you lost them like an hour ago. They're, they're back on ASCAP, you know? So thought, and, and a lot of times people just really wouldn't follow through. And, and it was, it's too much information and understandable. Understandably so. So I, I put it in a book and I tried to do it as step-by-step -step process from a perspective of a musician, 
um, not theoretical, um, not, um, not too technical, although I, I did include technical aspects, but something that was understandable. So this book is for, for a beginner or for anybody that's been working in the industry and only understands certain aspects of maybe just touring, but doesn't understand royalties or royalties, but doesn't understand touring. So that's who it's written for. And, and that's, we, we wrote it for everybody in mind. Career development, if you're home, not gigging. I mean, that's awesome. <laughs> And, and my cousin, um, Jen Carey, is a music uh, publishing royalty guru. That's her company. And when she read it, and she helped me get my royalties part straight, and she loved it. She said, you know, you really wrote it for that person that doesn't understand royalties. So she she liked that, and, and that's who I was trying to get at. Yeah, and I noticed you, you get into even internet based royalties and the like if i remember absolutely. correctly absolutely so um, important for people to understand that they need to own their masters and that they understand that they're the featured artist and that those royalties are different than your publishing or your writer's royalties so you've been in the music industry for a long time and being a musician is usually a life of self-employment as we've just been discussing <laughs> <laughs> We're working yeah. for ourselves. <laughs> um, maybe we do manage to pull a team together if we're so lucky. Um, that will help us. But uh, it's a lot of long days and motivation and the ability to be a self-starter. So um, I'm asking partly because I'm curious. I'm in the same boat. Um, how do you stay inspired and motivated? What do you do to put fuel in the gas tank? Well, you are a great self-starter. I must. <laughs> I get a lot of inspiration from you talking to you, and you're saying you're doing this and this. I'm like, oh, wow, okay, <laughs> you know. Well, and, thank you. And I, I, you know, I think that that's very important, um, and that we, as as independent artists, hang out with other people that also are self-starters because we inspire each other. And there are a few people, even when we, we book each other, uh, or when we, like JP is booking, he'll talk to our friend Lau Tizer, who is also an incredible self-motivator and self-starter and books himself. And they will share information, you know, because you get each other's juices going, you know, and, and inspire each other. Because when you are doing it all on your own, it, it can become daunting, you know, there, and, it's, and people don't realize that. Um, well, I would say probably for all of us, the inspiration is that we want to eat and pay our rent and <laughs> considering as somebody just, I think it was Holly Montgomery wrote, what, what is it when you wake up one day and find out that, that mom and dad aren't there to help and that you really are on your own. So you've got to get up and kick yourself in the butt. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> the meme of the dog with its own leash in the mouth, walking across the street. Yeah, exactly. Yes. So, you know, I, I, I write lists to myself and, and I, I try to do that every night. Like, okay, uh, these are the business things I have to do. These are the creative things I have to do. And um, I, I write myself lists like that to say, okay, now I've got to get up. And if I'm going to be booking a tour, what do I have to do? Okay, I've got to get on festival net right now. And I've got to look and I've got to see where I want to start or I've got to contact the people that have booked me over the years and just reach out and start talking to them and say, hey, you know, um, are you booking now? Has this started? And then you start calling them and um, just get that going. Like, OK, uh, what do I have to send out? Is my EPK ready to send out? Is it updated? Do I have my new videos that up there on YouTube? Um, are there new songs that I want to get out to people, new videos? So I, I have to get all that in line if I'm thinking I want a book. If it's writing, then who am I reaching out to? Am I, okay, do I, 
have I reached out to other libraries? Okay, uh, that's what I want to do. So and I'm going to call Sonaton, I'm going to call Megatrax, I'm going to call whoever and say, you know, what, what is there something new you're looking for in your library that you know that I, I can write? Or maybe I'll say, you know, I've noticed maybe you need more funk in your library and I, I'm ready to do that for you. So, you know, it, it's a lot of that. It's, it's, it's being organized. You know, it's really being organized and setting something for yourself. And I, I think you have to compartmentalize because if you just go, am I going to gig? Am I going to write? Where do I start? It's, it's overwhelming because you can just, you know, just splatter like, oh, I'm going to call. I'm going to do this. I think you've got to say, I'm going to do this right now. I'm going to call. I'm going to practice whatever it is and give yourself a schedule so that you know what to do um and 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 just you've just got to go you know you, you can't think too much about it if for one thing i mean you've got to think and be organized but i think for some people and i see this happening all the time with people they overthink it's like well i've got to have this and this and this and this in order before i make that call before i record before i do something yes you've got to be organized but you but don't overthink you know, get organized and then just go for it. You, you have to. And then if you trip over your words when you're talking to that promoter, well, so you trip over your words, you know, then, you know, next time. And, yeah. and then, you know, you refine your, your, your pat, your pattern. Um, but you don't know, you can only practice in the mirror so many times until you get that person on the phone that totally trips you up and is like not friendly or really friendly or whatever. And, and so you just work that. Um, so, you know, you know, you start being understanding if it's going to be uh, all the different possibilities of somebody saying something so that you can just start flowing. So I, I, I think that's it. And um, I think the other thing, and that was interesting talking to Mohini, too, is that she does everything herself. Yeah, and it was, that surprised me. Yeah. And I love that. She goes, and I like doing that. And and when you were saying about having a team, well, I think that's the other thing. I think a lot of us find when we try to get a team, it's so hard to, to try to get somebody to explain what we do, you know, and try to get somebody to book for you. And honestly, we've had agents that have helped us in the past a little bit, but I have had quite a few people I've met over the years that have gotten agents and then just let things go. And we're waiting for their tour. <laughs> yeah. Had a rude awakening when they found out that that agent booked five gigs and they were screwed, you know, and now they're backpedaling and, you know, trying to call and get those things filled in. So whenever we get an agent, we say, um, great. Okay. Here's who you can call. We're not going to stop calling. If you can prove to us that you can book a full season. Great. We'd love to stop booking ourselves, but we're not going, that's not part of our arrangement because we can't count on you yet, you know? Yeah. And, and you have to do that. And, and that's been problematic with some agents because they're like, well, no, we want to do everything. It's like, we, we can't do that. We can't rely on you because we've seen that happen too many times. So, you know, it's a combination of all those things. And then I think when you feel a little down is calling other people that do what you do and feeding off of each other and, and motivating each other. So that's worked well for, for me and for us. Nice, nice. So what is something you've done only one time in your career so far that you cannot wait to do a second time if given the opportunity? Um, JP and I did a tour. <laughs> I think I'm not sure. I um, <laughs> did a tour of China. We played the Beishan World Music Festival, just the oh. two of us. And I would love to go back with the whole band and really just tour Asia more extensively. It'd be fun to spend like a, a month over there with the whole band playing. And I guess I haven't done this, gone to Thailand, but I'd love to do that. You know, just, yeah. So I guess expand upon that with the band okay. and the duo. Yeah, that was if, you, a if you need a tour manager. <laughs> yeah. <I do>. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> oh. 
that's awesome. How did you guys? I'm just curious. How did you guys get that gig as a duo? You mind me asking? Oh no, no. I'm. You know, it's it's funny the way things lead to different things. Okay. So we were we played with the Ballet Fantastique before. Um, they the the people that I'm writing for right now. They usually just choreograph to our music. So I've done a couple of shows with them. And um, who did I meet? Uh, we were playing with Kim Angelus, a violinist, and she had done a couple of tours there, which was very funny, her, her story about going over there. But I, I think I'd asked her how she got there, and she turned me on to the person that brought her over there, and I reached out to him about the whole band going over um, to play the Bashan World Music Festival. And um, it was... <sighs> It was, he wasn't, um, it wasn't done in a typical touring way where, uh, I'm not sure if it was the language barrier or what exactly, but I couldn't get exact details out of him. Now, I totally believe, I had complete faith that it was, would be fine to go um, because Kim had done a great tour and I'd spoken to other people that had gone over there to do the same tour. Um but I couldn't get an exact money amount and I couldn't get a few specifics. So a couple of the other members of the band were feeling like, oh, you know, they didn't feel comfortable with that. So I reached out to him and I said, well, would you be comfortable just having us come over as a duo? So there was really no negotiating. He just like, okay, so you're coming over as a duo. And I was like, oh, okay. okay. Um, so it just, it, became that it was wow. easier than having to allay people's fears that we didn't get everything in so specifically the way they wanted it um and he just jumped on that it was like sure come on over as a duo we didn't quite put it that way and again i don't know if it was the language barrier or what but he was just said great you're coming as a duo and and so that's what we did it, it was a lot easier um we did get paid very well we stayed in nice places we played nice gigs it was it, great time really a lot of fun nice and, um we did try to go the next year but some some uh some rules had changed it was harder to get our visa to go the next year um there was a few things that that kept us from going over the next year you know there's there's constant um just constant things that are changing as far as visas and things like that in china and uh, so that's why we didn't go back. He wanted us to come back, and I really wanted to go back as the whole band. But it, it was very exciting. We played with people from from Italy and and from Argentina and uh, just all over. It, it was so much fun. And then at the end, they wanted to do something where people from different bands all got together and played. So they had a woman sing very traditional Chinese folk song and in a traditional Chinese um, vocalese as well. It was beautiful. Uh -huh. And then the um, solo artist from Italy that was that was looping and rapping and singing set up a loop and around what she did. And then two of the Argentinian guys played and then JP joined in and played. And it was just, it was so fabulous. Just everything coming together like that. I love that Peter did that on the, the last day of the of the festival. So yeah, it was a lot of fun. And I would just love to go back and spend more time. So we'll see. Crossed. Yeah, maybe things will open up, you know, after the pandemic is over and everybody will really be dying to get musicians back out and make things easier for us to get places. I, I hope the appreciation for what musicians do has gone up as a result. So the fingers crossed you get that. Yep. What is the best advice you've ever been given? Oh, uh, boy. Best advice that I've, I've ever been given. You know, people have given me different, there, there's been different things that people have said to me, but I would say really one of the, one of the best things is to just stay positive and be um, 
just be excited about things. Be positive. Look at the positive aspect of things and just keep moving forward and just keep asking questions and, and, and learning, you know, just, just keep learning on, on all aspects of things. So I, I think having people say things like that and, you know, I think I wish somebody had said really sort of stress that to me before, like just, you know, be really positive because I think sometimes as young artists, we can get so, um, so overly wrought, you know, so everything's become so, you know, serious and intense and we get so upset and, you know, and, and, and I think I've observed people over the years and went, wow, things seem to be going so easy for them. And you start looking and it's their, their positive attitude, you know? I, I would I would say that just try to keep a positive attitude about things and and focus on the positive. You know, even when things go bad, let it go. Don't focus on that because focusing on the bad things pulls you into that, and it becomes like almost a self fulfilling prophecy, and you get sucked into that, and then you feel down, and then you attract that energy. You know, just just try when things go bad to let it go, move on, and and look ahead, you know, set your sail ahead and, and, and look at where you want to go and don't let anything get in your way, even yourself. Yeah. It's, you can acknowledge that it's happening, but you don't have to let it own your soul. Yeah, exactly. I mean, don't you feel like that too, when things have happened? Yeah, that's, that's been a learned thing. Um, Absolutely. and I understand what, exactly what you're saying. Like, uh, sometimes you didn't know how good you had it, even when you were complaining, <laughs> yeah. just cause you were young. <laughs> And you didn't, you didn't have uh, the depth of perspective or experience yet. Um, <laughs> yeah. We had a kid on the street the other day um, roll his bike. I mean, it, it chain broke. He didn't mean to. You know, it's just his chain broke. This is a good example of it. Flipped handlebars in the stomach. You know, he's like down. He's bleeding. He's, you know, oh. he, yeah. In front of like me and somebody else. And we were just talking about some stuff we'd been going through, but like how adults do. The kid was just probably blood everywhere, you know. His friend comes over, picks up the bike. I'm with, with him, and I'm like, you okay? He's like, yeah. Why is this always happening to me? Like immediately. And he's, a, he's a teenager. It, it, that's, that's, you know, that's what they're going to do. And he was kind of really fixated on it. I said, you know what? It's, it's not always you, though. It's just your turn today. Did you tell him that? Yeah, and he kind of looked at me. I said, we all get a turn. It's okay. Today was just your turn. Go home and clean yourself up and put some ice on that. You're going to be all right. You know, and, my, and the friend I was with, like, totally got it. You know, he, he said the same thing. He goes, yeah, we were just talking about some stuff. We just went through. That was our turn. It wasn't fun. But everybody gets a turn. Today was your turn. <laughs> well, oh, great that you were there to say that to him and give him that perspective. Maybe it, you know, jarred him a little bit. So, you know, hopefully. You maybe, know. maybe. But I think that's the thing that you come through with time. You know, you just kind of like, oh, you know, like for me, it's just become, okay, today it's just my turn. Yeah. This too shall pass. And it takes a while to get there. It does feel like when you're younger, it's like, why is it always me? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. But I, I think I've seen people. Um, I don't know. They came into their positive perspective earlier on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I wish I, yeah. <laughs> yeah too. We can both I, say we, yeah. You <laughs> get those people and thinking, God, life seems easier for you. And you're always so damn cheery. <laughs> but that's a secret, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Good reminder there. Good reminder there. So, and good advice. Yeah, I, I think so. I think that's that's I think that's just uh, I think that that's so much of it, you know, really keeping a positive attitude no, ma no matter what. I think mm -hmm. that's and I keep reminding myself of that when I feel bad. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So what would you be doing right now if it wasn't for your music career? You mean if I'd gone into something other than than music? Yeah. What would you be doing right now? Well, maybe I would work with animals. I was, you know, I, I love working with animals. I, I, I love animals. I, maybe 
I don't know, go on, gone into animal training or studying or working at, I don't know, a zoo or with Jane Goodall or something. I, you know, I'm not sure, but maybe something like that. Um, I've, I've always thought that that would be interesting to do. Uh, you know, it's hard to say um, because I've, I've been doing this so long, but, but that is something else that interests me. Or maybe I would have gone more into welding and really just focused on, on doing that and making more sculptures and um, yeah, something like that. I, those are things that interest me. So if I hadn't gone into music, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure I would have probably delved into working with animals. I, I could see that. I could see that for you. <laughs> yeah. Definitely. Yeah. I love being around animals and I love rescuing animals. Um, just being involved like that, you know, re just seeing things that Jane Goodall has done over the years. It's just, she's so, she's been so effective and to feel like you were on part of that team and doing something that made a difference. Um, I would love that. Nice. Nice. Yeah. Okay. This is a dangerous question. Uh -oh. I want to ask it because I feel like I should especially for female artists. Okay. Okay. What is something that you are not getting credit for that you should absolutely be getting credit for? You can say pass if it's too. <laughs> uh, no. Um, you know, it's, it's not specifically, I don't get credit for it. Okay. Uh, I would say, but, when, when, because I work a lot with my husband, JP, when we will show up doing things or, or at an interview or talking to a client or whatever, I mean, sadly enough, even some of my female friends that we're producing will do this. They'll say something like, well, you know, ask JP about the production of something, or, you know, is JP going to be working on, um, uh, programming my song or you know, something, and I'll, and I'll say, uh, well, I'm going to be working on producing your song today. He may be working on it tomorrow, but today, or I, I, or yes, I did all the programming on that song, uh, or, or whatever it is. So th uh, that happens a lot. Um, and it's interesting to me because even strong women, there's something that's programmed in us um, that still, even though they're fully aware and don't like it, they think that the man is doing that for whatever reason, you know, it's, it's something. And, and then I'll, I'll say something like that and they're like, oh yeah, yeah, of course. Yes, that, that's right, you know? Um, and I think sometimes when we go into a room, people just assume that he is the one doing whatever it is. And he will always say, talk to Lisa, she's the one that is, uh, that produced that song or that wrote that song, or she's the one that did the programming. Um, and I'm going to be doing this while she's doing that to get people to focus on me and, and let them know that I'm the one doing that. So um, I do get the credit for it, um, but it's not like people immediately think that I'm the person that's doing it. So, you know, um, Got it. uh, if I just showed up by myself, perhaps, you know, it would be more obvious, <laughs> but then again, maybe they wouldn't ask me to do it, you know, how that goes. Um, but I, I really would say females are getting a lot more credit. You see a lot more female engineers and, and producers and um, people in the industry, but it, it's still people default that it's the man doing it. Yeah. So. There's some wiring that's still being driven by a stereotype, I think. And it's yeah. not, as you said, it's unconscious sometimes. Yeah, it, it is. Um, but uh, there's nothing out there that I, that doesn't have my name on it that, that I haven't, you know, that's, that's mine. It's definitely got my name. <laughs> cool. Thanks for, uh, thanks for taking on the dangerous question. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's kind of a good one because there's, you know, I, I felt there might be some area that, that 
people could identify that they would want to express something, a feeling, an experience about. So. Oh, absolutely. And I think, I think all females have that, you know, in one way or another. And I think it's a good question. You know, it's good to put it out there and to make, it makes people more aware that these are things that are happening because things like that prejudice, people don't realize, they don't even realize when they're doing it sometimes, even if they are fully aware that it's happening even to them, you know, you just get in this groove of doing things. And then when you call attention to it, I think it's good because it wakes people up and even wakes you up to go, oh, God, yeah, okay. But you don't, you can't change it unless you're awake to know that you're doing it. Exactly, exactly. So, good question. Call on, call, calling attention to the habit so you're suddenly self-aware it's, it's manifesting. Oh, oh, I, whoops, I snapped yeah. to that judgment or preconceived notion. Absolutely. Nice. All right. Starting your career over again from day one, what would you do differently, if anything? I'd have a better attitude and not take it seriously. Yeah, I guess that. I mean, and, and it's easy to say that now. <laughs> after, you know, it's hard to to have that perspective. But I, I think that would be it. You know, I would really just try to take things more in stride and have more fun from the beginning. Enjoy things from the beginning instead of making everything so dramatic and, and mean so much and everything, you know, it was just so important and rot and just enjoy the ride more. You know, I think that's it. Enjoy the ride, be more positive. Yeah. That's a good one. Yeah, because you don't know how long the ride's going to be. So you might as well enjoy it from day one, you know, as much as you can. If Incendio or the Carbe and Duran duo could open a show for any artist, who would it be? Either the Foo Fighters. Oh. Wait, wait, wait. One more time. Either the Foo Fighters or who? Peter Gabriel. Wow. I didn't see that coming. <laughs> I love Peter Gabriel. <laughs> but I love the Foo Fighters too. And I just love, you know, I'd love to just rock out in front of them. I mean, yeah, either one of those would be great. Nice. 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 Okay. So any, so I know you did the written interview, um, and it's been like a little while, <laughs> I think like a week or two, maybe three. Uh, oh. and I know you're, I know you're busy. So I want to ask, are there any new projects since we last talked anything on that you can talk about or that's come up that's new on your docket? Oh, well, we were talking about that, you know, um, I started working with Creative Exchange and SAS over there. And we had wound up doing a streaming concert for him because my friend Drake Shining had started working with him and then had said, why don't you reach out? Because he's looking for other musicians. So we reached out to SAS and he's such a great guy. And he just started this platform for musicians to connect with other musicians and to stream music and to um, hook up with other musicians if they need. Uh, somebody to play on their project so we did a streaming concert for him and then he interviewed us twice for thrive and survive and then he started asking us if we would be interested in interviewing other musicians based on thrive and survive and us talking about musicians that we knew and at the time we i think we did the last thrive and survive our friend carmen lundy was um, up for a grammy for best jazz vocalist best ja jazz album Nice. And so he heard us talking about her. And so he asked us if we would like to interview other people. Um, so we the first one we interviewed was was uh, Mohini Day last week or a few days ago, whenever it was, which was unbelievable and so inspiring. And, and really, I was so shocked when he was just said, yeah, I've got Mohini Day's number. Would you like to interview her? We're like, yeah, sure. <laughs> So that was exciting. And then he, um, very exciting. Um, and she's a gem, by the way, for anybody that doesn't know her and anybody that's not familiar with her music, you should go listen to her. You, you will just be inspired 
forever. Um, but he uh, has since asked us to interview other people. So on the 29th of this month, we will be interviewing Carmen Lundy. That's Thursday at noon. So that's at Creative Exchange with an X change. Okay. Uh, and then it looks like we'll be interviewing other people. We're, we're probably going to interview you too, Brittany. Um, Thank you, ma'am. So, so that's uh, that's one of the projects. And I don't remember what else I put in there. We're, we just finished a, a metal album for one of the the um, libraries we write for, you know, real nice. jump, 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 kind of thing that's out there. And uh, I'm working on the ballet. Um, we're working on some new songs for Carby and Durand. We've got Elkwood Lane, uh, a bunch nice. of songs with Elkwood Lane. So that's coming out slowly. We just keep adding and adding to that. Um, and I think that's it. I'm, I think I'm, that's I'm, it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Cool. Yeah. It, it has been like I think only a week or two since you did answer the uh, the written version of that question. So that's that's yeah. It's pretty cool. All right. So I uh, I decided to do a little uh, I guess segment involving my students um, in this. So we're going to close out on this segment. It's called intergenerational connection question. So. Um, the students sometimes know who they're going to get to ask questions of. Um, in this case, I picked a young lady named Kate Yoder, who is a bass player, and she would like to be a professional bass player. She'd like to go to music school. Uh, she's got a uh, leaning, shall we say, towards video and audio production. I thought she'd be a good match for this okay. interview. <laughs> so... Um, I have some questions from her for you. Okay. So question one, from a composer's perspective, what is the best way to move past a creative block? Um, I think to, to give yourself, like, to give yourself a project, like, Listen to a piece of music. Say if you, if you want to write a, a, a piece of rock music and you are, you just can't come up with anything, then listen to somebody else's piece and figure out what they're doing and then compose a piece in that style. Listen to what they're doing. Don't copy them, but kind of get a sense like this is what they're doing. They're going one four. So maybe I'll go one five or whatever, but listen to that style. How do they break it down? How many bars is that verse? How many bars is that chorus? How are they transitioning? And then try to write something within that style, but without copying them. Maybe invert, use a, use a, 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 a composing technique where instead of making a melody that's going up, if that's what they're doing, make a melody that's going down. In, invert that melody. Um, change up the chords, but do it in a similar way. Uh, you know, give yourself an assignment and just do that and force yourself to go through that so that maybe you're not being just, just pulling something out of the air, but giving yourself kind of a, a map to go from and, and, and force yourself like, like you were having a, a an assignment. Okay, like so I've got a rock tune. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Okay. I think we, we may have already hit the question on this, the, the answer for this question earlier, but I'm going to ask it anyway in case it's any different. Um, yeah. What advice would you give to a younger version of yourself? Oh, yeah. Well, that, that would be to, to, to really in, enjoy the ride. You know, enjoy the ride and, and study. You know, just practice study, learn as much as you can, and, and just don't let the downer people get to you. Don't let shit people say to you, dissuade you, you know, set your sail for where you want to go and get there. If somebody's giving you a bad time, then those aren't the people you want to be around. Don't own shit people say to you. Don't own it. 
It's their opinion and you know where you're going and just stay on that. Just that, that stuff coming in, like, or, or stuff that you're saying to yourself, I suck. I can't, you know, I'm getting there and this is what I'm going to do. And I've got to practice. And if I'm going to be working on video stuff, then I'm going to start working on it. And I just keep going and talk to positive friends, you know, just stay positive. I mean, I, that's, that's the best advice I can give you. Just keep moving ahead. I, I I can literally see this person as she gets older being a very good fit in this circle of people. We got to keep an eye on her. I'm just going to okay. say that right now. Just <laughs> so on our team on our positive team. <laughs> it, right. Yeah. Yeah. So what advice do you have? This is her final question. Okay. So what advice do you have for high school students looking to go into music school or applying to music? college you know a music program at a college what advice would you have well i i guess decide if you want to go to a college where you're studying um general ed as well as music or if you want to go to a college where you're just die doing a, a hard dive into music just to a music school you know um like berkeley or something you know, de decide which it is that you want to do. Do you feel like you want to learn all the general education as well? Is, is that going to behoove you? Is that something that interests you? Do you think you want to, um, you know, I, I don't know if you have to do that to become a teacher if you feel like you want to teach, you know, I, I don't know that. Um, we have a friend now that, that we're actually, um, just sort of mentoring because she's just going back in your first or second year of college with the whole pandemic thing, but she's back East and she's just going to a music school and, um, oh no, she's going to an art school, but she's also a musician. So we're talking to her about her music. So, um, if you can, you know, find out as much about the colleges before you go, you know, try to, if you can't visit the campuses, um, Try to find out about the teachers. Is, is that a teacher that you feel like you would like to study with? Um, what is the curriculum? Is it is it more classical? Is it more jazz based? Do they have a good music um, business program? If that's something you want to do, do they have an engineering program? Something if you want to st study engineering and production, do they have that? You know, find out what their specialty is before you, you go into it. Um, if you just want to be a, a vocalist, you know, find out, do they have good vocal instructors there? So, you know, really do your due diligence about finding out about each one of those colleges, because just because it's a music college doesn't mean it's the type of music you want to study or that it necessarily has a teacher there that you're going to um, have it be a good fit for, that you're going to like, that you're going to connect with. And that's so important that you connect with the teacher. And that it might be a great teacher. It just might not be one that you personally connect with. So try to find out as much as you can about those teachers before you go into it. Um, and, you know, really, maybe you don't want to go to college. Maybe you just want to keep, you know, honestly, maybe you just want to keep studying and just jump right in and, and start performing and just get out there um, and just find a private teacher to study with where you can be studying theory and your instrument or a couple of teachers where you're studying more about theory uh, or, or studying about engineering and performance and getting out and playing, you know, see if that's something that might be more um, beneficial to you. Yeah. You know, ask see that. And, and find a good mentor, find somebody really good to talk to uh, that's knowledgeable and they can give you good advice. That's really important. Finding somebody that, knows what they're talking about to give you good advice. Nice. Nice. Yeah. Lisa, thank you so much for your time today and your wisdom and uh, sharing your stories. You're oh, welcome. Sure. Thanks for having me. This is fun to share. And yeah, I think this is <laughs> going to be a series for you. <laughs> well, thank you so much. And uh, yeah, we'll talk again soon. Okay. Thanks a lot, Brittany. And uh, yeah, we'll talk soon. Okay.